In 2006, Disney created a real, live, human being, the Cartoon Rabbit. There's a famous Walt Disney quote that goes, I only hope that we never lose sight of one thing. That was all started by a mouse. But that isn't exactly true. Walt started off with Laughogram Studios. They made very simple, rudimentary animated shorts, mostly based on fairy tales. He wanted to make a new short based on Alice in Wonderland that would blend live action with animation, where the role of Alice would be played by a young girl named Virginia Davis, who would be superimposed into the cartoon world, but the studio went bankrupt before he could complete it. So Walt sold off his camera for just enough money for a one-way ticket out to Hollywood, where he would seek to find a studio willing to pay him to complete the film. It looked like Disney's career was going to end before it ever even really began, and this really could have been the end of his story, if Margaret Winkler, one of the pioneering producers of early animation and the first female member of the Motion Pictures Producers Guild, hadn't been involved in an ongoing feud with Pat Sullivan, the creator of Felix the Cat, one of the earliest breakout stars in the medium. The feud led to Sullivan leaving Winkler's studio, and Winkler looking for an animator willing to give her a new cartoon cat that she could rub in Sullivan's face. The deal was struck between Walt and Winkler, leading to Disney's first successful series, The Alice Comedies. They blended live action with animation, just like Alice's Wonderland, and they saw the young leading lady going on adventures with Julius the Cat who was more or less a ripoff of Felix the Cat, which was exactly what Margaret Winkler wanted from Walt. It's interesting to note that Pete was a recurring antagonist in this series, making him the oldest Disney character still being actively used by the company. 57 Alice comedies were made between 1923 and 1927, with many of them having been lost over the years. They were popular, but their success began to fade over time. After marrying another producer, Charles Mintz, Margaret Winkler merged much of her company with his since she wanted to be able to focus on raising their family. Mintz was looking to expand the offerings from his relatively new company, Universal Studios. They wanted their first cartoon star, and Walt wanted to start doing a new series of fully animated shorts. It was a perfect fit. And with that, Oswald the Lucky Rabbit was born. Cartoon characters at the time were often kept simple, so animators could use them for whatever random gags they could come up with. But Walt wanted to set Oswald apart by giving him a distinct personality and building the shorts around that. Not just a cartoon character, but an animated movie star. The shorts themselves would do something new by taking inspiration from silent movies of the time and comedy acts like Laurel and Hardy. They weren't meant to be a series of loosely connected gags like most cartoons of the era. The shorts would be a comedic routine that built over time, one joke leading to the next, leading to the next, all built around Oswald's personality. This might all sound simple and obvious looking back at it now, but at the time, this was revolutionary. The first Oswald the Lucky Rabbit cartoon was going to be Poor Papa. Rabbits have a reputation of being very, well, to keep this family friendly, let's just say, loving, and having a lot of kids. Oswald's first short was going to be built around this concept, showing him as a stressed out parent trying to deal with 30 newborn bouncing baby bunnies. Universal liked it, but thought that a cartoon about a middle-aged character experiencing the difficulties of parenthood might not be relatable to younger audiences. They also asked for tweaks to the more sketchy style of the animation. So Walt and his partner Ub Iwalks went back to the drawing board. Literally! They came back with a younger, more energetic Oswald and a more polished look for the Lucky Rabbit's first officially released cartoon, Trolley Troubles, in 1927. It was a hit, Universal's first major animated success. And with each new cartoon, Oswald was only getting more and more popular, so the Walt Disney Studio grew to meet the demand, eventually having a staff of nearly 20 people, which was a lot for animation studios back then. Walt and his brother Roy invested the Oswald money into purchasing land and investing in oil. Iwalks used his money to invest in stone mills that could be used in the paint production process for the cartoons. 
But as the Disney studio became more and more self-sustaining and independent, Walt and Mintz began to butt heads. Though Oswald was too popular for these personal squabbles to really get in the way, Universal signed a contract with Disney to keep making Oswald shorts for at least three more years. But Walt didn't trust Mintz to renew the contract again, at least not with agreeable terms. So while in New York with his wife Lillian for the premiere of the new Oswald shorts rival Romeo's, Walt visited with some of Mintz's rivals, talking to Fox and MGM about the possibility of a new deal with them. He tried to use these talks as leverage with Universal Studios in 1928 to negotiate a better deal. But with the Great Depression on the horizon, Charles Mintz wanted to cut back, not expand. They wanted Disney to make cartoons faster and cheaper without a raise in pay. But Walt wasn't going to sacrifice the quality of his films to make a greater quantity of them, and he felt he deserved a higher pay rate. So negotiations fell apart, leading to Walt leaving Universal behind. But because he didn't own the rights to the character himself, Walt had to say goodbye to Oswald the Lucky Rabbit, and leave him behind too. Riding the train back home after leaving Universal, Walt decided that he never wanted to risk losing the rights to one of his characters ever again. If he was going to make that happen, he had to start from scratch with his own studio and a new character. It was on that train that he created Mortimer Mouse. And then his wife told him that name was dumb, so he changed it to Mickey Mouse. Walt saw his new studio and made Steamboat Willie, the first cartoon with sound and the first Mickey Mouse short to be released. It was a gamble. Making a film with sound was a new and expensive process. Walt and his team pulled pretty much everything they had into it. If it failed, they were done. Of course, if it had failed, this channel would be called like Pi the Sony Guy or something like that, so obviously it all worked out. Steamboat Willie was a major hit and absolutely eclipsed even Oswald's most famous shorts in terms of popularity. Walt Disney was, of course, a gracious winner. Though Oswald did still find some success with Universal for a while, Margaret Winkler produced a few more cartoons for Uni, keeping more or less the same style as Disney. But Universal knew they needed a Walt in charge. So, they got a man named Walter Lance to take over as producer for the character. You know, close enough. With his first short as producer releasing in 1929, Race Riot. Oh, that's an unfortunate choice of a name for it. Let's just move on. Over time, Oswald's design transitioned to be less like the unique and full of personality version that Disney had created to be more like the generic, cute cartoon characters of the time. Rounder eyes, friendlier smile, they made him wear a shirt. He became an almost entirely new character slowly over time. And then, with the release of The Case of the Lost Sheep in 1935, he really became an entirely new character. Should we cast Pietro? He now looked much more like a regular rabbit with the design based on an entirely unrelated cartoon Walter Lance had worked on previously, The Fox and the Rabbit in 1935. This started a new era for Oswald as the shorts became softer, more safe, more cuddly, aimed at a younger audience than before. Something closer in tone to the Winnie the Pooh books than what Oswald used to be known for. In a more direct ripoff of Wayne the Pooh, Oswald was one of the stars in a series of comics about stuffed animals brought to life, alongside Woody Woodpecker, who was a robotic tin toy with a screw loose, explaining his crazy behavior? It was a weird mix that didn't borrow much from these cartoon characters beyond their names. Even having Oswald adopt two kids, Floyd and Lloyd. These multiple redesigns were just one part of the identity crisis that Oswald went through during the Universal years. During this time, sound became the norm in cartoons, but Oswald never really had a steady voice actor. Nicky Rooney was probably the most notable voice for him, and he did have the job for about a year. Then, the treasure belongs to you. But after he left the job, the role of Oswald's voice was mostly just passed around the animation staff like a hot potato. What made Oswald stand out when Walt Disney created him was a focus on personality and a unique charm. He was Oswald the Lucky Rabbit, and that meant something. But now, everything from his voice to his appearance to his personality changes from short to short. 
He continued to drop in popularity until in 1951 Oswald made his final cartoon appearance for Universal, a cameo in the Woody Woodpecker Poker. Once possibly the most famous cartoon character in the world, Oswald went on to fade into obscurity after over 20 years with a company that never really had a clue what they wanted him to be. Over 50 years later in 2003, people from Buena Vista Games picked up video games starring Oswald the Lucky Rabbit to Bob Iger. At the time, he was president and COO of the Walt Disney Company. Universal still owned the rights to the character, so the project was a no-go, but it stuck with Iger. Something about just felt right to him. So when he took over as CEO in 2005, he made it his mission to get Oswald back, even making a promise to Walt Disney's daughter, Diane Disney Miller, to bring him home. This all raises a question of how much an obscure cartoon rabbit that hasn't been popular since the 1930s was worth to Universal. The answer, apparently, is one human. Disney created ESPN sports anchor Al Michaels to the Universal-owned NBC Sports in exchange for the rights to Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. A real live human being for a drawing of a bunny. Of course it wasn't just any doodle, it was a very meaningful cartoon character to the company and to the Disney family. Walt's daughter, Diane, even commented about how she appreciated that Iger was a man of his wars and how much fun she thinks it'll be to have the character back. The grand plan for Oswald's return was centered around the video game project that would grow into Epic Mickey. As that was struggling to go off the ground, Disney started quietly reintroducing Oswald. A t-shirt here, a DVD compilation there, baby steps. But still steps. In 2007, Disney teamed up with Junction Point Studios, a new game company founded by Warren Spector, producer of Deus Ex. He had a lot of experience making games in the 90s and he was hugely passionate about Mickey Mouse, old Disney shorts, and Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. There was a clear vision here to tell a story that could both revitalize Mickey as a real character again, instead of just treating him as a corporate mascot, and to bring Oswald the Lucky Rabbit back into the spotlight in a big way. This was Epic Mickey. Released in 2010, it was a dark tale about the Wasteland, a world full of forgotten and unloved cartoon characters. Oswald was the king of this lost realm, but the Phantom Blot terrorized this land and the Lucky Rabbit was powerless to stop him. Mickey is sucked into the wasteland by the blot, and he has to fight off an army of evil monsters to save this forgotten world and find his way back home. At first, Oswald is jealous, bitter, and resentful of Mickey's fame and adulation. But over time, the two become friends and work together to save the day. The original concepts for the game were much darker than the final product, but even after it was cleaned up, Epic Mickey was still a surprisingly somber tale. There was this real sense of hopelessness and loss among the citizens of the wasteland. The gameplay was a throwback to older 3D platformers like Mario 64 or Banjo-Kazooie. Jump around, explore the world, solve simple puzzles, and collect stuff. But this game didn't just take some inspiration from the titles, it also took their faults. The camera was terrible, it made the game tough to play at times, and the controls were weird and awkward. And despite the big talk of technological achievements, it all felt very dated. While the story was great and the world was interesting and Oswald was a popular character with fans of the game, overall it was kinda just okay, earning generally average reviews. But it laid a good foundation with its world building and creative ideals. It seemed like a promising start to a potential franchise. And so work began on Epic Mickey 2, The Power of 2. What an awful name. That's just a terrible, terrible name. Not even the same kind of two, one's a number two and one's spelling it out too. <sighs> as well as a 2D platformer spin-off for the Nintendo 3DS called Epic Mickey Power of Illusion, which also served as a sort of sequel to the 1990s Sega game Castle of Illusion starring Mickey Mouse. Why do all of these games have terrible names? I know like I'm used to it at this point, but Epic Mickey is also dumb. Alright, moving on. These contain the story of Oswald and Mickey going from rivals to brothers and saving the wasteland from nefarious foes. And they fixed a lot of issues with the first game, but they wound up creating a whole host of new gameplay problems. They received worse reviews than the original, but still not necessarily bad reviews. Sales numbers, however, <laughs> well, they were necessarily bad. 
Epic Mickey 2 only sold about a fourth of what the original did, despite being on three times as many consoles. It was bad. So bad that it forced Gungeon Point Studios to shut down completely. The planned finale to the Epic Mickey trilogy as well as the kart racing spin-off were cancelled, and Disney decided that big console games in general weren't really a good idea anymore outside of Kingdom Hearts. Oswald's grand return to the spotlight fizzled out. Although the character isn't completely forgotten, there's plenty of merchandise and you can meet Oswald in a few of the theme parks. Tokyo Disneyland uses him as a host for their Easter celebrations, California Adventure has a shop named after him, Disneyland Paris even did a show with him for a special event a few years back. But that's really about it beyond a blinking or miss it cameo in the Mickey Mouse short Get a Horse which played before Wreck-It Ralph, and a tongue in cheek reference to the character Stas as a bit of a forgotten relic in one of the recent Mickey cartoons. There are rumors of a Disney Plus series based on Oswald, but that's just rumors for now. Whether the future does hold for Oswald the Lucky Rabbit, he remains a favorite among many Disney fans. An icon from another era, and a perfect example of an older style of cartoon who carries that classic charm with him to this day. A key piece of Disney history with a story that is truly baffling. I hope you all enjoyed this video, it's been a while since my last baffling history and it was a lot of fun to get back into it. Make sure you subscribe to see more Disney and theme park history videos like this, as well as my other series, History and Pie Minutes. <laughs> Mm-hmm. 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 Mm-